Hi, welcome to the West End Video Newsletter. Uh, tonight we have a little bit of a different show. Uh, we have with me Frank Levine, an old-time West Ender who grew up in the West End, uh, hung out in the West End, got drafted into the Army, and there's a lot of things most people don't know about Frank Levine is Frank Levine was uh, on the boats that went over uh, to Israel in the, after the Second World War. And I think it's a story that should be told. And I think most West Enders don't know Frank was involved in that. And I intend to, to bring it to light today. And uh, I'm gonna, right now I'm going to introduce, uh, this is Frank Levine. How are you doing, Frank? OK, Jimmy, OK. And uh, uh, before, before we do anything, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, see a little bit of video, approximately five or 10 minutes worth of video that uh, who, somebody, somebody did it, uh, a show on the, the, the boats. It was, and we'll, we'll go to that, and then uh, when we come back, we can discuss what we've seen, in, in, that we've seen just preceding that, okay? Uh, well, let's go to the video, Joe. It looked like a matchbox that had been crushed by a nutcracker. The ship was, oh, what a mess the ship was. I mean, torn up, ripped up, people wounded. As 4,500 Jewish refugees were crammed aboard a Chesapeake Bay steamer. These refugees, survivors of the Holocaust, chose to leave the ashes of Europe behind and sailed for Palestine. Their ship was called Exodus 1947. Exodus failed in its attempt to land its cargo in British-controlled Palestine. But the aborted voyage caught the world's attention. Exodus became a symbol. An American ship built for pleasure cruises on the Chesapeake has been described as the ship that launched a nation. A small group of ordinary Americans conspired to change world history. The Americans who financed and crewed the ship had no experience in politics or diplomacy, yet they took on the best of the British Foreign Office, and they won. We, of course, broke the blockade, we broke the mandate, and I think we damn near broke the British Navy. The crew came from Brooklyn and the Bronx, Cincinnati and San Francisco. Some were as young as 16. A number had just returned from fighting in World War II. It was not an easy thing to tell parents that they'd be sailing halfway around the world on a dangerous mission. I said, Mom, I've got to go away for six months and I can't tell you where I'm going. <laughs> I've often said to kids, try that on your parents sometime. I didn't tell my parents anything. I didn't tell my parents anything. I was going on an extended vacation. This was a very, very quiet thing. President Warfield was saved from the scrapyard with $40,000, towed to a dry dock in Baltimore and refitted. Lumber, blankets, medical supplies, and 4,500 life jackets were needed. Leaving the shores of France, the excitement started. The silence was broken by laughing, singing, dancing. Everybody has hopes for a new life, 
Everybody was excited, but at the same time, scared. Irene Brunstein, age 15. The refugees' fears were justified. As dawn broke, a British man-of-war loomed on the horizon. The minute we left set, we already had several ships, British uh, naval ships waiting for us, and they were trailing us all along the way. My name is Ronald Bundle. I was on board HMS Checkers as a lieutenant. I was one of the lieutenants on board. We used to anchor off and patrol up and down the coast, mostly at night time, uh, to intercept any illegal immigrant boats coming in. The British Navy's plan was to trail the warfield across the Mediterranean and board her when she reached Palestinian waters. The British had successfully trailed, captured, and detained dozens of smaller ships. I mean, for us, it was just another ship that came in with a whole lot of Jewish immigrants. Uh, it was a big one. Okay, end of story as far as we were concerned. The British ships broadcast warnings. If the warfield did not turn back, the British would board and seize her. We had seen these guys. They had been following us for four days, five days. And they had some big, big vessels. These were warships. I was scared. I was scared. Dear Mo, chances are very slim as far as getting through the English are concerned. I don't know if I'll be able to mail any letter in my next port, so don't worry if you don't hear from me for a few weeks. Regards, Bill. July 16th. Three more destroyers joined the chase. The warfield received coded instructions from Haganah headquarters in Palestine. Captain Ike briefed the crew. They were instructed to outrun the British escort and beach the ship in downtown Tel Aviv. The drill was that we were going to get as close to the shore as possible and run the ship up on the shore. Jump in the water, swim towards the shore, people will be there and take care of you. Fine with me. This is why I had the bathing suit. We went southeasterly uh, direction till we came just north of the Egyptian coast. In fact, the British thought that we were going to land on a mud bar down there. We came so close in. July 17th, sunrise found the war field now steaming north towards Palestine trailed by the British escort. We tried to keep on the landward side of them so that if they do make a dash for the beach, we could get in and uh, get in there first. The refugees and crew waited for a final showdown. We had been up for like 24 hours before, all of us, preparing. We had put uh, barbed wire around the ship. Barbed wire barricades were put up to deter British boarding parties. Rocks from the ballast, potatoes, and cans of kosher corned beef were stockpiled on deck as ammunition. We didn't use firearms. We were told not to use firearms because the British could blow us out of the water. So these were the things we were doing, and we were up for 24 hours. I was, I was barely, you know, uh, barely awake. Only hours from her destination, trailed by six British warships, the President Warfield at last revealed her new name. July 17, Thursday in 1947, we put up the Mug and David, the Star of David, and the sign comes on the ship, Exodus 1947. The Haganah changed the beaching site to Bat Yam. The Exodus was to make the approach, staying just outside territorial waters, and then execute a fast dash for shore. The Haganah ordered the Palmach, its armed wing, to send 30,000 men to Bat Yam to get to the Exodus refugees before the British. The situation was critical. 
A firefight between the Palmach and the British on the beaches of Batyam could be the spark to total war. The British Navy had no intention of letting the Exodus get to the beaches. When the British sailors and Marines started jumping on the ship, I started chasing them you know, trying to grab them and, and uh, throw them over the side. They boarded her, Marines and Naval personnel boarded her, and there's a raging battle over her decks. We had, we had, we had, we had ship, we had to get, and stop her, go to the beach, etc. We had to get hold of the wheelhouse. Ten British Marines rushed the wheelhouse and they were met by second mate Bill Bernstein, who refused to surrender the wheel to the British. He tried to hold them off with a, with a bloody uh, uh, fire extinguisher, you know, like this, and uh, he was clubbed. Bill Bernstein was clubbed unconscious, and the British seized control. As dawn broke, the battle waned. The refugees and crew had been tear-gassed, clubbed, and shot at. The wooden superstructure was breaking up, having been rammed repeatedly. And by 6 o'clock in the morning, the people were standing there uh, like there was no bulkhead left, watching. We did have a responsibility for 4,550 people. We gave them a hell of a fight. We fought them for four hours, the longest that any ship had ever fought the British. And that was it. We surrendered. OK, we're back. And I hope you found that as interesting as I did. And uh, we have the star, or one of the stars, of that particular uh, video and Frank Levine right here. Frank is. Uh, going to elaborate a little bit more over here what happened. Uh, Frank, let me tell you, how did you first get involved in this? How did, how did this all come about? Because I'm sure you didn't walk down the street and just jump on the first ship that was sitting in the harbor. <laughs> it's very interesting. This happened during World War II. I was uh, in the Army Air Corps uh, at a special school in Urbana, Illinois, Chanute Field. Mm -hmm. I heard of a dance at the University of Illinois, which was in, uh, in Champaign. Right. I went to the dance and I met a group of young people who were pr preparing to go to Palestine after the war. And they were taking agricultural courses. This was an agricultural school. Mm -hmm. I became friendly with them and uh, in the course of our conversations, they learned that I was a sailor. I had sailed in the West End. On the Charles River. On the Charles River, <laughs> taught by Joe Lee. Right. And I had gone from, from uh, uh, small boats. I had sailed in fairly large, large boats, mm -hmm. uh, 30, 40. The Boston Wheeler, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 40, 50 feet, feet long. Right. And they learned this. When the war was over, we had still kept in touch. I got a telephone call from somebody that said to me, we'd like to speak to you. And that's how I got involved. That's amazing. There was even a West End connection into how you get on the boat. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really strange. It's funny how those things happen. Yeah. It's, uh, life is interconnected, I guess. Uh, somebody once said cosmology. Cosmology. <laughs> uh, the conditions were pretty primitive on that boat, from what I can see. And you guys had a really rough time, I think. Well, uh, it, it, b ships were very, very difficult to get at that time. The mm -hmm. war was just over. M most shipping had been destroyed. Right. Okay. The only place they could get a ship was in the United States. And this one was taken out of a scrapyard. This ship had seen right. service during World War II. Uh, she couldn't carry passengers anymore, and she was put in a scrapyard. 
She was bought by a group from Palestine, and uh, she was in tough shape, yes. It certainly looked it. Yeah. And, you know, the courage to go over there and to do those kind of things with the, with the, with the you know, British battleships. I mean, you know, the British battleships were the, uh, you know, the, the, I guess, the standard of the world, you know. Well, we had just defeated the Germans right. and the Japanese. Right. American kids, we were winners. That's right. Couldn't lose. Nothing could stop us. Yeah. You see, we, we yeah. came back from World War II as, as, yeah. you know, as winners. That's right. And uh, that was it. That was it. Yeah. And you know, uh, that, whole, that whole episode, okay, and it's been, you know, put all over the world, okay, as the, as the birth of Israel, actually. True. I mean, it was the, the embryo that that uh, developed uh, in, into what is now Israel. Otherwise, the you know the world wouldn't have cared, except that you guys brought it to the attention. The the mistakes that the British made were so bad. Right. You see, the British had Palestine at that time. They had their own reasons for wanting to keep it, mm -hmm. and they did all sorts of things to. Uh, hold on to it, and as a result, they did many foolish things. And one of the f most foolish things they did was attack this ship, mm -hmm. okay, carrying almost 5,000 refugees. Mm -hmm. And eventually, after many, many weeks of uh, turmoil, sending it back to Germany. They sent these people back to Germany and put them in prison camps in Germany, in the British zone of Germany. At that time, Germany was divided into four zones. It was okay. uh, the American, British, yeah. the British, the Russian, French. and the French. Yeah. And the only place that the British could take us was to the British zone of Germany. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to take us back to Palestine. They didn't want to take us to Cyprus and they took us to Germany, the biggest mistake they ever made. And uh, at this time, the United Nations was trying to decide what to do, mm -hmm. whether to give Palestine to the Jews, to give it to the Arabs, to split it between the Jews and the Arabs, let the British have it. They didn't and th know what to do with it. And they had observers in Palestine and mm -hmm. Europe at this time trying to figure it out. And they saw everything that was going on. They saw what the British did. Mm -hmm. They saw the British uh, take us off the ship, put us on prison ships. Mm -hmm. They saw us uh, uh, in, in, uh, off the coast of France for three weeks. And they, they... I don't know if it was brought out in that, but three people died and you told me. Yeah, uh, when the British, British captured the ship, they killed one of the American volunteers. He was a guy from uh, San Francisco, a guy by the name of Bill Bernstein, who had mm -hmm. been in the American Navy. And two of the young refugee kids, uh, it, 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 we had three casualties, other mm -hmm. than the 100 wounded. Actually, you were wounded too, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I was wounded. Yeah. Uh, and you told me you were, you, were, you were in the sick bay. Yeah, the guy that died, the, the Bill Bernstein died right below me. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both in the sick bay together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it seems amazing. It, <laughs> you know, you, you you look back at then and how different the world has changed. You know, in in, in those forty years. Yeah. It? Well, it's it's fifty years. It's fifty Jim. years. It's yeah. fifty years. This yeah. was forty-seven. It's a, a, you know it's. A, a, it was 50 years now. Did anybody get seasick on that boat? <laughs> yes. We had young green kids. When we took that ship over from, uh, from Baltimore mm -hmm. across the Atlantic, we got hit by a very, very bad storm. Mm -hmm. We weren't out more than eight hours when we hit a, a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh my God. we had some kids on there that hadn't, you know, hadn't been on boats before, and they were sick. We could barely, barely, you know, we had to go back to shore and repair the ship. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. there was seasickness, and there was mm-hmm. seasickness among the refugees. I, I say that because, you know, I was in the Coast Guard, and we had some minus seas, and they, I, I got sick. So, anyway. uh, it's, it's, well, it's not funny. We won't describe it. No. Maybe people are it, it, eating it, it, while they're yeah, watching this thing. Yeah, it has, has a certain, a certain uh, no, no, uh, it, mystique it, to it. Right. When yeah. you're at sea, yeah. uh, until you get your sea legs, mm-hmm. it, it, takes, it takes time. That's it. What were the actual repercussions that happened to all you guys? Did, I mean, after the, did they let you go after a time, or did you have to... Well, we were record or you know no we we were prisoners of the british even the american volunteers there were 11 american volunteers mm-hmm. that stayed with the refugees when we were sent back to germany by the british mm-hmm. okay and we were eventually smuggled out of the british prison camp mm-hmm. uh, and traveled across europe back to france through the British zone, through the American zone, uh, back to France. And until we got to France, we had false papers. Mm. We had uh, papers that said we were refugees from Europe. Mm. Okay. Uh, At least you can say you've seen Europe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The back, the back of, a, of a truck. You mean you didn't get involved with the French resistance? <laughs> no, this was the, the war. Yeah, know, the I'm war just, was just, over. Yeah. We were taken from the, uh, that part of Europe yeah. uh, at the time was just full of camps, uh, military barracks that had been taken from the Germans, yeah. uh, and they were being used to house refugees. They were called displaced persons That's by right. the United right. Nations. That's right. And uh, these camps were all over Europe, okay? Mm-hmm. And we were taken, smuggled from one camp to another. Keep That's one, the way. The, one step ahead of the authorities. Yeah, right. We were on the run from, mm-hmm. the, from the British, and we didn't want the Americans to know that we were Americans. Were, were the, were the, was there any possibility of, we'll say, repercussions from the American authorities? Would, would they have done anything to you if, if you had been turned over to them? Or was that... Uh, probably, yes. Mm. They probably would have. That's why we didn't want any American authorities to know who we were. That's mm-hmm. why we were disguised as refugees. Yes, right. <laughs> because there would have been. Because the British were very unhappy with mm. what was going on and they were telling the Americans that American volunteers were involved in this and they'd better mm. stop this because they were causing the British a That's lot right. of trouble. Causing them pain and aggravation. Yeah, right. Yeah. I guess that's the legacy of Diane, maybe. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Is there anything else? Uh, you know, can you tell us again? There was some of the, some of the highlight. No, we'll say lowlights of the trip. Actually. <laughs> you know, uh, well, looking back, they may be highlights, but you know. When the, the British put us on the on the prison mm-hmm. ships, yeah. Okay, we thought we were going to go to Cyprus, mm-hmm. and. Um, that was not to be. The British decided that they, we were, were were going back to our port of embarkation, which was set in France. They took us back to France and tried to force us off the ships. This was in June and July, Mm -hmm. and the Mediterranean can be very hot at this time of year. There were three prison ships. Each one had 1,500 men, women, and children on them. Mm -hmm. We lay in those prison ships for three weeks off the coast wow. of France. We lay in those prison Ooh. ships like like animals. I can imagine. Really, yeah. it, was, it was really, really rough. Mm. And uh, that's... Yeah, it's a, it's, it was like really, really... It was a long, harrowing trip. It, uh, three uh, weeks. You know, I have, the, I have the utmost respect for you. I know I've known you for a while now. <laughs> and, uh, and, well, yeah. it's... it's uh, it's ancient history. Yeah, but ancient history, like it was Voltaire that said those that, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you know whoever, the old song. Whoever said it, whoever right. said it. I think it was Voltaire, yeah. But uh, the... Yeah. the uh, those that don't, you know, was it read history? It doesn't to repeat it. You know? I learned a lot. Yeah. I learned a lot. Yeah. I, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, rub shoulders with uh, uh, many people, Holocaust survivors, mm-hmm. and... Uh, Better than any book. Yeah. Actually, books. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> Actually, books. David Holly. Yeah. 
wrote this book, and the excerpts from the film, excerpts from the film, hmm. are taken from this book. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, right. A lot of the script was written from this book. It's uh, published by mm -hmm. the uh, Naval Institute Press, yeah. and this is the second printing. But Exodus, when the Exodus, there was a book Exodus, wasn't there? I thought Exodus. the movie was taken from uh, Eur Leon Euros's. Uh, no, 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 no. This, mm. this, there was another documentary made. Oh, okay. Okay, there was another documentary, and it played on PBS this last uh, last April, I guess, mm -hmm. April, May, or June. Uh, I didn't see it in the States. I saw it in Israel when, mm -hmm. they, when they showed it there. Yeah. But um, I guess it showed all over the country. Yeah. But the script was taken from that, oh. that particular book. You, you, you go to Israel quite a bit now. You, you've been over there. Yeah. You go away for two months every year or something two like that? Two or three months. Yeah. Yeah. I go to a place that was a former camp that the mm. British used as a prison. Yeah. It's called Atlit, yeah. and uh, it's now a museum dedicated to not to the Exodus, but all the ships. Right. There were more. That, that, we should make that clear. There were there more. Were, there were many, many right. ships. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were 10 ships from the United States mm -hmm. and 250 American volunteers mm -hmm. sailed those ships right. and carried almost half the people that were brought into Pa uh, Palestine at that time from Europe, mm -hmm. all Holocaust survivors, refugees mm -hmm. and Holocaust survivors. So uh, there were many, many ships, many, many ships. And like I say, I, I think, you know, most of our peers, when I say most of our peers, I'm talking about West Enders, just so many people don't even realize that you were involved in all of that. Well, uh, uh, and you know, I, I think it's something to be proud of. Well, I, I know you're, you're you're not the kind of person that likes to beat your own drum, I, so uh, you know, I, I have a tendency to. Well, it uh, all of us, right. all of us, the guys that served on these particular ships, mm -hmm. uh, will tell you that these this time that we we put mm -hmm. in volunteered were the defining moments in our lives. Yeah. Okay, they, they, they really changed our lives. And actually, it was a seminal moment for Israel, too. Yeah, so, right, so right, right. To be it part was, of something that, is, that, that became as big as, well, say, Israel. I mean, I don't, yeah, you know, right. on, on it, that type it, of thing. It, too. Changed, it changed To be part lives. of history, I guess, is exactly what I'm, what, what I'm right. trying to say. Is to be part of history in, in that type of uh, a moment. There yeah. isn't a book, a contemporary book, that I read about Israel mm -hmm. uh, history yeah. that doesn't mention the ships, mm -hmm. you know. It, it's, uh, and it's interesting to know that I was part of it. That's I think it. you were, Frank, and I have the utmost respect for you, and I always will. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, <laughs> so we're going to have to wrap this up. And uh, I guess we'll see you at the next West End Video Newsletter. Bye.